Hi, my name is Lindsay Maestri. I'm the executive director here at LUCA and today I'm going to give you a tour of the LUCA Summer Showcase. This is a painting by E. Bova. As you get close to this work, you realize that it's made of a series of tiny dots. That process is called pointillism. It's a work by sculpture professor William Cannings. Will's process is really interesting. He takes metal and welds it together and then heats it up and inflates it with air. You can kind of see the sense of balance there. This next set of paintings is by Maisie Alford. Maisie sets up these series of objects that seem like they may not go together and it always leaves you questioning what the story is between these objects. This is a series of small sculptures that I actually made. Uh, my background is in studio arts and every now and again I am able to get into the studio some. I like working in this small format because it allows me to kind of jump in and out of the studio easily. This piece is by James Johnson sort of an exploding color piece. He's loaded up his brush with a lot of different colors and then uh, painted them directly onto the canvas and outlined them so you get this really nice explosion and, and action happening in this painting. This is a large scale paper installation by Song Mi Yu, she's a printmaking professor at Texas Tech. Song Mi really wanted to play around with the light and the shadows and this floor element here on this piece. We had a show scheduled to come in from Miami for this month. But as you can imagine, with COVID-19, our plans changed, but we are so thankful to have so many talented artists in Lubbock who could hop in and help us out um, and were able to put work into this show. So we really are thankful for them for acting so quickly and helping us get this show together, which really turned out to be a fantastic show. What we really enjoyed was seeing how many of the artists were playing around in the pieces they brought in. This is a piece by John Whitfield. John's known for these sculptures that are made up of a series of circles, but here he's playing with even more circles on the ground and the satellite dish and the lights in the middle of the piece. These next two paintings are by Shannon Cannings. Shannon is really well known across the state and really across the US for her water gun paintings. But here she's breaking from that and playing around with these targets. So new work, some studio experimentation. This is Zach Morris. This is a piece made of found objects it's really like a little altar piece on this gun rack. This next piece is by Danielle East. This is for black girls in Lubbock who often forget they are magic. Danielle is the director of East Lubbock Art House. I really love these little details in the piece. This is another piece that I made. 
I've had a little more time to play around in my studio since COVID-19 hit. Um, been doing some of these formal experimentations. And last, this is a piece by Cody Arnall. It's where all the sound has been coming from. So sound of the railroad tracks, it lights up. It's got this arrow towards the top. A lot of different elements happening in that work. The Luca Galleries are open again. We're open Thursday through Saturday. You can pre-register for a time slot online. Just visit us at luca.org. We hope to see you in the gallery soon. You've got the words to change a nation, but you're biting your tongue. You've spent a lifetime stuck in silence, afraid that you'll say something wrong. If no one ever hears it, how are we gonna learn your song? So come on, come on, come on. Stop hiding it away Come on, come on I want to sing I want to shout I want to scream Till the words dry out So put it in all of the papers I'm not afraid They can read all Hi, my name is Demetria Williams, owner of Art by D. Will, located here in Lubbock, Texas. Right now I'm standing in my studio and I'm going to go ahead and show you a few of my pieces. I specialize in mainly portraits, but I can do a variety of things. I love embracing everything black and showing how beautiful we are. If you're interested in a piece, you can contact me on Instagram and I am Demetria, or send me a message on Facebook. My Facebook is Demetria Williams. You can also purchase uh, paintings online and prints at artbydwill.com. Thank you. So come on, come on.
WTDR Dance Company.
The first thing you have to learn is how to conscientiously pay attention, not take something, an experience, and put it in a box that has a label on it, but just don't bring any boxes. There's a kind of protocol that we all have when we go out bush to be involved in the landscape and have an experience that is highly imaginative. But here's a funny thing. As soon as you bring language into experiential adventure, you truncate the experience. Language always collapses reality into meaning and once it takes place, then much that's there at the periphery that might be useful three days later gets buried, it's lost. The idiosyncrasies of attentiveness that define you can't really gallop. They can't get up and run. If you keep stopping them to discover what you think the meaning of the thing is. So don't try to reduce what you're experiencing in language. Welcome to the Allison House at the Buddy Holly Center. We're going to go ahead and head inside to do a quick little tour so you can see what we would normally show you here at the house. J.I. Allison's family home. His family lived here during the duration of the 50s. The reason we have Jerry's house, the drummer for the Crickets, the Hollies moved around quite a bit, so we actually have a list of 13 different addresses that we do keep on file in the gift shop. So we're going to go through today, give you a few little fun facts, a few things to clear up if you've ever seen the Buddy Holly story, the film starring Jerry Busey in it, and a few other quick fun facts as well. So we're going to get started here in the living room. So if you have seen the film starring Gary Busey, you'll know that there is a scene where the crickets are named due to a cricket being in the wall of the garage. Now the reality was it was actually very popular at the time to name your group after some sort of bug or insect. The group was a big fan of another group called the spiders. So the reality is they sat down in this living group with an encyclopedia of insect names, flipped through that. Some of the names that they passed up on included the grasshoppers as well as the beetles. They ended up settling on the crickets because crickets make their own music. Now not everything in the house is going to be original to the time that the Allisons were living here. And there are two major reasons for that. One being there was a tornado in 1972 
By that point, the Allisons were actually living up in Nashville, Tennessee, which is where Zayat currently resides. The remaining individual pieces that are original include the painting on the wall. That was a popular paint by number done by Mrs. Allison, J.I.'s mother. There's a photograph on the wall of Louise Allison and her husband, J.C. That is also original to the litter. And we'll go ahead and head to J.I.'s bedroom now. J.I. did share his bedroom with his older brother, James, when their family first lived here in the LBK. He didn't have to share it for too long, so this bedroom actually became the location where Buddy Holly and the Crickets would write and record music a little bit while they were here in the Lubbock area. Now, the biggest song to have been written in this bedroom was Peggy Sue. Peggy Sue was originally titled Cindy Lou after Buddy Holly's niece and his sister. They did change the title of the song per request by a young J.I. Allison, and so it did become Peggy Sue later on. Now, the drum set here, this was a drum set that did belong to J.I. It doesn't date to when the crickets were together, and that original set, of course, no one knows where that is due to time. The second the boys had opportunity and funds for something better, they went ahead and did that. J.I. did set this one up for us. And he did it the way he would have. The tom drum, which is the top drum here, is upside down. J.I. would do that purposely. That is the sound he liked. Over here against this wall on top of the piano, you will see a photograph of a young J.I. Allison for the Lovac High Westerners marching bands. You'll also see a New Orleans City limit sign. The story behind that sign is the boys went on a trip to New Orleans to hear real music. On the way back home, they noticed a New Orleans silly city limit sign. It appeared to be falling, so the boys went ahead, took it off, put it in the trunk, and brought it back home. Um, I've been told that if you ask J.I. about it, he will simply say the statute of limitations. <laughs> we'll go ahead and make our way here through the restroom. I'll meet you in the master bedroom. All the photos along the wall were donated to us by the Allison family in order to help refurbish the home. You will notice as looking through these photos, you won't see a photograph of Buddy in any of them. That is simply because they were all taken after February 3rd of 1959, the day he did die. Here in the master bedroom, the biggest song to have been written was actually That'll Be The Day. That'll Be The Day, of course, was inspired by the John Wayne film, The Searchers. The boys went to see that film, came back here. Betty started to pace the bedroom, told J.I. they should write a song. Being funny, J.I. tried to impersonate John Wayne's line, saying, That'll Be The Day. Buddy said yes. About 30 minutes later, the original country western version of That'll Be The Day was completely written. The rock and roll version that we know later was re-recorded, and that was due to some contractual issues. Uh, but anyway, it was written right in here. Um, and our final location is going to be here in the kitchen. Now here in the kitchen is where majority of the original pieces to the family are going to be located. Those include the dining room table and chairs, the wooden hutch against the wall, the glass grates and copperware, the kitchen sink, and the bottom of the island we built up from there. There's also going to be a phone against the wall. The phone itself is not original to the house, but it has the original shared landline number in the middle. 
if you are curious. So another fun fact to think about is there's also a scene in the Buddy Holly story starring Jerry Ducey where the boys are driving down what is supposed to be 19th Street of Lubbock, Texas, right out front of us. In the beginning of the video, you could hear some traffic going on, but in the film, there are mountains in the background. That's not a thing in Lubbock, it just happened to show up in the film. Well, thank you for coming on this tour with me today. My name is April. I am a gift shop assistant here at the Buddy Holly Center. We hope to see you all whenever we open up again. Thanks for coming along. Hi, my name is Tori Stewart. I'm from Round Rock, Texas, and I'm currently the house party artist in residence for the East Lubbock Art House. I am a full-time artist, and I am currently studying visual studies at Texas Tech University. I work with all mediums, such as jewelry and welding, as well as drawing. This has kind of been my studio during quarantine. But as an artist, I primarily focus on painting, so here are the projects I've been working on the last two weeks. These pieces encapsulate the feelings of the new standard of realities that are being exposed based upon different fragments of perspective. Just with some extra stuff to spice it up because you got to right now. I'm trying to provide various relatable compositions that display what the public is mentally feeling right now with the crazy times going on. Thank you for tuning in and y'all stay safe out there. Juarez. The characters. Sailor, a Texas boy just returned from duty with the Navy in the Pacific, is on leave in the port of San Diego. Juarez was like this kind of mystery that happened to me over a period of about five years, and it really built itself. A lot of the images and whatever came from traveling a lot back and forth between Texas and in uh, California. But I always thought that the characters in, in, the, in Juarez, uh, you know, both the music and visually, they were always about climates. They're about climates kind of in motion and colliding with one another, whatever, more than actual people. The original, the first, uh, the body of drawings, the first body of drawings I did, uh, there were no people. There's no, you know, they're all, it's all landscapes and objects and uh, uh, kind of residue from incidents. And then when we left uh, uh, California for about five months in 1970, uh, I had a studio in Lubbock out on the Ilu Highway. And uh, I wrote some of the first songs and the first drawings. And they really did come kind of at the same time, you know. Uh, and I was very conscious of not wanting the songs to be illustrations of the drawings or drawings to be illustrations of the songs, but it was like one s specific set of information on one side, another specific set with maybe the music on the other side, and what, what the piece was about was going kind of down the middle of it. Terry Allen's Talking Trees are part of the Stewart Collection at UCSD. He is a multidisciplinary artist in the truest sense of the term. In addition to his indoor installation sculptural work, which is emphatically mixed media, and his paintings, writings, and drawings, Alan is also a songwriter, composer, pianist, and lead vocalist who makes country rock records with his own panhandle mystery band in Lubbock, Texas. Alan has an installation that is part of Insight 94. I've kind of... Um since the beginning had written in my notes um, across the razor or across the razor. There was a show in, uh, it was called Insight 94 and um, uh, they invited 50 Mexican artists to show in the U.S. and 50 U.S. artists to show in Mexico right on the border. I went and just did a visit and I had no idea they were building a wall. Uh, at the time. And they had taken a lot of the uh, metal sheets that they were used for tarmac in the Iraq war uh, that were kind of left over and, and 
these metal sheets that started in the Pacific Ocean and had built, already gone almost 40 miles or something across, if, into the interior. I was shocked at the, at the, uh, the fact that we were building a wall. And, and uh, there's one little slot right off the ocean that uh, had a circular concrete pad with a uh, monument kind of in the middle of it, a little pylon in the middle of it. And uh, so the, the wall came and stopped right at the circle, and then there was a chain link fence that went right up to that monument. But you, it was the only spot you could really kind of see the other side, see through if you were standing on the ground. But the monument was a, a testimony to the friendship between the United States and Mexico, you know. So it was like kind of the ultimate irony prick, you know. And but that that image, and I started thinking about, well, I'd I'd like to have some kind of interaction between the you know Mexican side and the U.S. side. And I initially proposed um, two concrete blocks, one on each side of the border, uh, on the beach, right mm -hmm. down, uh, that were probably. 30 feet, I think, away from the wall on each side with a um, um, sound system, a microphone speaker system in it, where that people could actually walk up and stand on this platform, this concrete, and speak to the other side. But when they started kind of testing the waters with the bureaucracies that they would have to deal with in terms of build, building this thing, um, they just kind of hit a brick wall with it. and. Uh, uh, so I, I tried to th think how I could still do the, have the same idea, uh, but something that wouldn't be quite as threatening to people. And I just basically put it on wheels. I put it, put, decided to build platforms on vans uh, with a ladder, for the, and, and they became this kind of mobile free speech units, or, you know. People came up, and I think because of because they were suddenly above, elevated, and they were looking each other in the eye, there was an eloquence that happened and a response, kind of a res responsibility that people took on that I never anticipated, but it, 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 was, uh, it was actually beautiful what people said to one another. This is Co-Ops Research and Projects, and uh, we're an ad hoc DIY gallery. We've been open for almost one year. We do um, shows where we bring in artists, where we curate exhibitions. There are multiple members to the co-op, uh, myself, as well as Cody Arnall and Lindsay Maestri. There's uh, Aaron Hegert and his wife, Natalie Hegert. There's also Andrew Weathers and his wife, uh, Gretchen Korsmo. And then lastly, and certainly not least, two more, a power duo couple. There's Seth Warren Crow and Heather Warren Crow. So together we form the members of Co-op Research and Projects. And this is the space here. We're both a gallery space and a studio space for artists, uh, myself, Cody, and Aaron. And we have studio space in the back. So this is the current exhibition up now by Carolyn Doherty. Uh, it's called Ruse de Guerre. Uh, which basically translates to false flag, the term used in war whenever one side of um, a battling duo will fly the flag of their enemy, uh, it, basically to show that they're their friend when in fact they're foe. So that's what this exhibition is dealing with here. Caroline's based out of Buffalo, New York at the moment, originally from Massachusetts. What, what I like about this show is that it focuses primarily on the flags. And there's actually two different ways that we can show this particular work. One is, as you see it here, where they're installed on the inside of the gallery. But we also have installed flag mounts on the exterior of the gallery, so they can be mounted on the exterior to capitalize on the windiness of Lubbock, Texas. But contrasting to the flags, which really occupy a, a sort of have a visual presence in the gallery are these small little pieces. There's one here on this wall and one on the adjacent wall. 
And um, there's sort of these quiet moments that are very easily missed. This is what you're looking at now, a cast bronze almond. So Caroline made a mold of an almond and cast around 72 of these in, in bronze. Uh, this is just one here. And she also has this uh, little paper mache micro megaphone thing here on this wall. Yeah, very delicate, quiet work. Caroline's from Buffalo, New York, and she came to Lubbock to specifically do this installation. And while she was here for over a uh, two week period as a sort of unofficial artist in residence program here at co op she made this video work. So we took her true false flags that are installed in the gallery. We mounted them in the back of pickup trucks and she choreographed this, this dance out on a farm in shallow water, Texas, um, where these trucks are just going in circles, continually looping into one another. And that's the video piece that you see in, in this particular room. The main reason that co-op exists is uh, it exists as an art studio for Cody and myself and Aaron. Uh, we got together originally just over drinks, looking for artist studio space, and this is the space that we ended up in. So first and foremost, Co-Opt has been functioning for us as a working artist studio. And that's the space we're in now. Most of the works you're seeing are Cody Arnall's pieces. He just got back from a residency up in New York. So he just brought back those pieces and it, in many ways, co-opt exists uh, in response to the First Friday uh, art trail. You know, anybody who's gone to that event can, can see that it's exploded. There's, in fact, almost too many people at these events. One of the reasons we can't open up uh, in our current situation with the, with the virus. So we figured about a year ago that Lubbock really had room to grow, to expand out beyond the first Friday venue. And so we have specifically catered ourselves to small audience exhibitions. Um, we get maybe a dozen, two dozen people show up to our shows and we typically do them like mid month. So we're, we're not interested in doing a first Friday event. In fact, we're, we're willing to do shows on Sundays or Thursdays. We're willing to do them in on the 13th or 14th of the month rather than that first Friday event, which everyone is expecting. Um, in short, we feel that there's room to grow and expand in Lubbock in the arts. And we're seeing opportunities, not just with us, but with other people attempting to do that in Lubbock as well, which is really exciting as an artist because it shows that, that Lubbock is growing in its cultivation of creativity in the arts. So yeah, that's why we're doing what we're doing. The other thing that we have here at Co-op Research and Projects is a curated concert series by Andrew Weathers and Gretchen Korsmo. It's called Longitudes. Uh, until now, we've had roughly 12 of these experimental and improvised performances by artists from all over the country, but as well as local artists like Above the Empire. We've also had uh, Tyler Simpson come and play some jazz music. Really good stuff. Essentially, it's performances that wouldn't happen in other venues here in town. So it's much more experimental. Occasionally there's video components to it. We've had artists come in and do seed bombings in the alleyway as part of a sound experience. Um, so it's very eclectic, very different. It's not something that you can go see at like Jake's back room or anything like that. Um, so that's sort of another element to co-opt where we're not just providing the visual arts, but also the sound arts as well. It's, we're really catering to forms of experimental creativity.
Painting for me uh, has become almost a meditative exercise in a lot of ways. I was bemoaning the fact that, that we don't have a lot of mountains and streams and rivers and, and those typical things that people love to paint in Lubbock. And this good friend of mine said, paint what excites you, paint what you know, paint what you're passionate about, and paint what you enjoy. I love to paint things that are, uh, are, are rural and, and, and sort of almost mundane in a lot of ways but they have a story to tell. Watercolor is a very interesting medium. It's a transparent medium, which means that means we paint from our lightest values to our darkest values, and we layer them on top. We have to think ahead, and if we want something to be white, we have to not paint it instead of paint it talk to a lot of my oil painter friends and they always say why in the world would you paint in watercolor it's too hard you know it's too difficult it's you know it's not predictable it's not controllable and i think that's what i like about it actually it's active and it's ever changing and it's it's intuitive in a lot of ways you have to be thinking ahead you have to be reacting to what happens and then at the end of the day it is just paper and if it's a total flop you just throw it away but when it happens right, it's, it's, it's magical. It really is. I grew up in, in West Texas for the most part. And so I've, I've always been drawn to, to those stories that, that you see played out in structures, old farmhouses. I love to imagine the stories that happened around some of these places that we all drive by. So I drive by uh, an abandoned farmhouse and I start wondering about the people that lived there, the people that built that place, the life that they had, you know, start imagining uh, how many children did they raise there? Did they have a happy life? Was it a sad life? What was it? I live in West Texas and we got long horizons. We have the land. And so I paint the sky and I paint the land and the, it's that point where the sky and the horizon intersect with what man has done there that always kind of gets my attention. So it's the old farmhouse, it's the grazing cattle, it's the grain elevator, it's the things that I see every day that I drive by and I think, I'd like to, I'd like to capture that. I don't have a lot of inborn natural ability, natural talent. I've just got a lot of desire. I just enjoy it so much. This inborn talent is way oversold. Uh, I mean, it's, it's overrated. What you need to do is enjoy it and do it and learn from it. And you'll be amazed at what you could do. I preach all the time is, is, man, if you haven't painted, you need to try it, you know? If you haven't created, you need to create something. If you haven't found an outlet where you can express yourself, well, you need to, because I think it's something that's in all of us.
jeans up and screams so your head hurts Shotgun rider and she never looks back No, she doesn't look back I've been sleeping all night, not enough, not enough You've been running through your mind, catching up, catching up I've been reading all the signs, need a little to the right Are you thinking about love? Are you thinking about love?
don't know, I got my bike to my bark. Black jaw, just like I'm a dog. Thank God that he made me a god. Hit smart and I'm using my heart. Hit hard and I'm under the park. Let's spar, I be born for bar. Raising a bar, crossfit, never get off it. A posit, make a deposit. Staying on topic, avoiding the gossip. About who lost her, used to pop it. Lock it, twist the bop it. I don't care who goes, I'ma solve it. Woo! Big stats, triple double, all the goats in trouble. MFA with no muzzle, hella sweat for my struggle. Straight path, no stumble, pass the ball, no fumble. PhD in a duffel, upgrade, I'm big pay. Love the ball in my own lane, many T's, one D same. Try the map, been back again. 360 is a boomerang. We the Kongs and we the Kings. Hong Kong, they debut to play. I don't speak no continents, but I speak in a lot of things. Every second I'm hustling, used to have a whole lot of friends. But I don't trust not none of them, cause jealousy live in all of them. So I close the door and abandon them before they bandwagon in. Again, 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 and again, 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 and again. Baby kill so my over small. I'm over y'all, like some overalls. I overflow like a waterfall. My grind is original, no typical. Who you know this versatile? Name them all, far away to wow. That's what I thought. I'm a boss, call me Skinny Ross. Black man with a mogul walk with white fans like I'm Asher Roth. I'm the flame, they the moth. I'm cut from a special cloth. Competition getting pissed off. Corner party for the urinal. All the hate in the sewer hall. My flow like Big Shine. Super duper, ooper, trooper, scruper, ooper, duper, scruper. Then I group you, fruits and lose you, mid maneuver. So I work with no rest. So my parents get big flex. Door sold out, that's big checks. All my haters got big stress. I lose them all, foot on their neck. That metaphor had no respect. I'm here to win, what nothing else. I'm on God's team, that's why I'm blessed. Thank you, Savior, cause now I savor, and God said that we is favorite, we is favorite, yeah. Yo. Unless you guys need some more, I got some more. I think I'm good. I think that was hot. Yeah, hit me, son.